Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode in the Marine Money webinar series. I'm your host, John Chair, and I'm charged with handling the content and membership side of the business for Marine Money. Um, to start, I want to apologize for last week's audio issues. To remedy this, I have braved the abandoned office to ensure we have good connection and social distancing from others on my network. So fingers crossed this gamble works. And today we are going to be discussing LIBOR. More, more importantly, the fact that LIBOR is going to be a thing of the past come next year. To talk us through this wonderfully exciting future is Richard Henderson, a partner from the law firm, sorry, from the law firm Elliman Reinflesch Godot. Now, before I hand over the controls to Richard, I want to quickly inform the audience on some ground rules before we begin. You'll be on mute during this webinar to ensure quality control of the audio. But during this webinar, you have a control panel that should pop up on your screen like I'm showing right now on mine. Um, this is where you can engage or not in the webinar. Today, there are two primary actions you can take. You can either ask a question. And to do that, you just simply enter your question to the text box at the bottom of the control panel where it says questions. I will receive them. I will receive them. And if we have any time at the end of the webinar, I will ask Richard the question on your behalf. The second major action is the ability to collapse that menu so you can see the presentation in all its glory. You can do this by clicking on the little orange box at the top with an arrow in it. That should collapse the control panel and you should have a full screen. All right, so now that we have this technical part um, out of the way, I'm going to hand over these controls to Richard um, and he can take it away. So Richard, let me know if you have any issues. Do I have issues? Hello. No, I think I'm fine. Hello, everybody. Um, Hold on. I'm giving it to, uh, controls to you now. Excellent. Richard, let me know if you get there. Quest. There. Perfect, Richard. You're all. You're away. Thank you very much, John. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm not sure whether to say good morning or good afternoon. I guess it depends where you are. For those of you uh, sitting there in your pajamas, uh, probably cover up your camera just in case there's a technical glitch. For those of you uh, going around the supermarket trying to get shopping, uh, if you could just use the chat bar to uh, send in uh, news on what's available. LIBOR is what we're here to talk about and the end of LIBOR. The London Interbank Offered Rate. Well, <clears throat> This is something, if we just think about the past of it, it grew up uh, with the euro currency markets uh, in the post-war years and the rise of floating rate notes. When it began, it was uh, an informal assessment by the bankers of the rate at which they could uh, borrow wholesale term loans. Um, and it became a published rate when the British Bankers Association took it over. They're not so much a regulator, they're more of a, a trade association. And from there it grew into what it now is, which is a, a formally designated benchmark under EU legislation and regulated by the UK's Financial Conduct Authority. And in that process, it's become quite disconnected from its roots. The majority of its users are no longer uh, lenders, but their uh, derivatives um, traders or uh, providers, and it has little or no substantive connection with the uh, wholesale term lending to banks. And as a result of that, it probably met its demise. Up on screen, you can see uh, two quotes. One is Walter Riston, chair and CEO of Citicorp. For uh, what's that, 17 years, who pointed out that the euro dollar market exists in London because people believe the British government is not about to close it down. And Andrew Bailey, chief exec of the FCA, who in 2017 announced that LIBOR can no longer be sustained in a benchmark. So, uh, ignoring Mr. Riston's advice, he decided that the British government is about to close it down and he uh, <laughs> announced its pending end in 2021, the, the end of 2021. Um, Mr. Bailey, it should be said, has uh, since gone on to be the chairman of the uh, Bank of England, uh, and uh, as of uh, earlier this month, uh, whereas 
his ambition that the market should uh, replace LIBOR with a, a new and better uh, substitute has made uh, slightly less progress. So, <clears throat> let's understand where we're going with this. When we say LIBOR is going to disappear, it sort of depends what you mean by LIBOR. If you mean that original concept, which is the, the rate at which banks can borrow from each other in the interbank market, there's absolutely no reason to suppose that that's going to go. Uh, banks will be able to borrow from each other uh, uh, on an overnight basis or for term loans, and they should be able to do that through London or uh, other jurisdictions or, or markets. So in that sense, LIBOR is not going. There will be a London interbank market uh, for loans and the rates which are offered will be the London interbank offered rate. If you want to find out what the rate is, you just pick up the bank over the phone and ask for a loan from another bank. Um, syndicates, syndicated lending uh, can do either take the individual rates of each bank or has become common practice, you appoint reference banks or representative of the makeup of the syndicate and take the average of the rates that they report they can get in the market. So in that sense, LIBOR is not disappearing and that is LIBOR as it originally existed. And if you want to use that as a basis for lending, you can do so, but you have to understand that it will be a personal LIBOR, determined internally, uh, rather than something which is transparent, published, available for borrowers to see on screen, etc., etc. And as a result, that sort of LIBOR rate will vary from lender to lender. Uh, better credit worthy lenders will have a, a lower rate. And so if I'm a borrower approaching banks and they offer to lend on that sort of LIBOR, I have to understand that there will be a pricing difference between the banks as to what their LIBOR rate is, not just their margin rate. Um, and uh, for many borrowers, that would be a step backwards from the current position where it's a transparent basis, which is commonly used, and they need to only compare the margins. But that is, let's be clear, what you currently see in most loan agreements now as a fallback rate <coughs> in case of uh, there being you no know, screen rate available or market disruption, et cetera, et cetera. So in that sense, what's clear is that LIBOR itself is not going but published LIBOR is going. Um, LIBOR as a published benchmark rate is the one that's disappearing. Uh, the published rate is, is collated by, from a, a panel of banks reporting in and saying what their rates are. The average is worked out and it's published uh, each morning by the current administrator, which is uh, the ICE. Uh, benchmark regulator, uh, which is then in turn regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK to persuade banks that they need to provide the necessary information. <clears throat> and when we say LIBOR is going, what we actually mean is that the FCA is no longer going to use its powers to make banks report their data. Uh, at the moment, it doesn't actually compel them anyway. What it does is it persuades them but it reminds them that it has the legal power to make them supply data to the benchmark administrator. And they've announced that they're going to stop using those powers of persuasion and or legal compulsion as of the end of 2021. And it's imagined, expected almost, that at that point, any number of the panel banks will cease to provide the information which is necessary to make the calculation. And as such, the the calculation that is produced by the administrator, if it indeed continues to produce one, will become less and less reliable. It will cease to be sufficiently reliable uh, to qualify as a benchmark under the EU benchmark regulations, and that will cease and make it prevent it being used for things like derivatives, and eventually it's regarded that it will wither away. <clears throat> and the intention was that people would uh, realized that was going to happen and they would, uh, the market as a whole would react to that. Remember this is from 2017, this notice was first given and we're now in 2020, the market would react to that by getting together and agreeing a suitable substitute. 
as we get nearer the deadline, um, it's fair to say that the uh, FCA, Bank of England, etc., are starting to look more and more nervous as to whether the market will, in fact, step in and uh, provide uh, or work out a common approach. There's only a year or so left, and they haven't got there yet. Um, <clears throat> but a number of uh, clear uh, tendencies are arising. The first is that each jurisdiction, uh, for which there is currently a libel rate, is going its own way. So we have uh, the moment LIBOR is, is produced for dollars, sterling, euros, yen, and Swiss francs. And <clears throat> of course, the essence of being euro currencies, with the exception of sterling, is that they were all being priced in London, which is outside their jurisdiction of, of, of national currency. And the tendency is that under the new approach that everybody's adopting, they will all be going back to their home jurisdiction to find a solution. So the UK is, is coming up with its own solution for sterling, leaving the US to produce a solution for dollars, for example. <clears throat> and, and in a way, that's a long step away from the origins of the euro currency markets, which this came from. The other clear tendency is that people are focusing on switching from the current type of rates to what are called risk-free rates. <clears throat> LIBOR is based on unsecured uh, interbank lending rates, which are inherently have built into them an element of credit risk uh, because the borrowing bank is, is uh, borrowing on an unsecured basis for a period of time and therefore there is credit risk on the borrowing bank. And the switch is, is seems to be moving over to what's called risk-free <laughs> rates. Um, it's quite interesting in a way that uh, in the process of looking at LIBOR and how suitable it was, <clears throat> the FCA commissioned a couple of studies. And one of those studies came to the view that uh, if you're in the derivatives market, risk-free rates are probably much more appropriate than rates with a credit element built into them. But if you're in the lending market, a credit-based rate is, is more appropriate. And that seems to be sort of getting lost in the chatter uh, and wholesale, everybody seems to be moving over to risk-free rates, which possibly reflects the dominance of the derivatives market over the wholesale lending market. Um, <clears throat> for dollars, uh, everyone seems to be focusing in on what's called the secured overnight financing rate or SOFA. Uh, otherwise known as the repo rate, and for sterling, it's heading towards something called the sterling overnight average rate, or SONIA, which is actually an unsecured overnight rate, but somehow is regarded as being risk-free. Despite the momentum towards these substitutes, there's no certainty yet as to whether they will be adopted, and there's another layer of uncertainty, which is that if they are adopted, the exact mechanics of how they will be adopted have not yet been reached a point where people can be uh, on common ground. <clears throat> and if you can't get onto common ground, then you find that you can't compare products. So if you're in the secondary trading market, for example, on loans, uh, you would need to, uh, you wouldn't be matching like with like if they're all done differently. What people want is a common basis and a common mechanic so that they can all be certain that you can interchange one with the other and price them accordingly. Essentially, what you end up with is what's referred to as a Betamax risk, which is that you don't want to invest heavily in Betamax, only to find that the market opts for VHS. The uncertainty uh, holds people back from actually proceeding with putting new options in place because they're all waiting to see what everybody else will do first. And if nobody's going to go first, then we don't get to a position where we can actually move forward. And as a result, sitting in my office, we're still seeing almost exclusively LIBOR-based loans being done as the new loans in, with more or less wording introduced to cope with the idea that things may change in the future uh, and LIBOR may no longer be with us, but still loans being originated on a LIBOR basis. So, from the regulator's point of view, there's not enough panic going on. Uh, the problems 
are that the market on its own isn't isn't doing anything or isn't doing enough to agree a replacement. It causes problems with existing loans, so that if you've lent uh, on a term basis, which will overlap the end of LIBOR, have you got a mechanism in place <coughs> to deal with the possibility that LIBOR won't be with us? There's a whole range of commercial contracts out there which uh, reference LIBOR in them. What's going to happen to those? And then there's new business. Of course, <clears throat> how do you change if you don't know what to change to? So the lack of progress has clearly caused concern. And the Bank of England recently uh, decided to wield a bit of a stick to encourage people uh, along a little bit and announced that they're going to discount LIBOR linked collateral from October 2020. In other words, <clears throat> this effectively will increase the regulatory cost, at least to a, a UK regulated bank, of maintaining LIBOR linked assets. Uh, they followed it in uh, February this year with a, a bit of a carrot in which they published for themselves an index of the SONIA, the secured overnight rate, which is uh, the one likely to be used for sterling, on the basis that if somebody puts out a, an index which could be used, that is most likely to be adopted rather than somebody else coming along and having to develop their own and worry that it might not be the one that's chosen. And then, uh, just this month, we saw the Federal Reserve have began to publish uh, not only the overnight index for SOFA, but 30, 19, 180 day averages, so that effectively you could use SOFA for term lending going forward in, into uh, if, if you wish to adopt their uh, index. But we're still at a stage where most of the solutions are not actually solutions at all, but interim measures. So that what we're finding is uh, people are reviewing their existing agreements to see if they will continue to work if there's no published libel. And, and the, the simplest method of that is to check whether there's a, a cost of funds fallback arrangement. In other words, something which effectively takes the loan back to that personal LIBOR that we talked about at the beginning, rather than a published LIBOR rate. The LMA, which is a dominant force <clears throat> on this side of the Atlantic for producing loan documentation or the basis for loan documentation, have put out wording where um, it will make it easier to adopt a, a replacement rated LIBOR goes from whatever is available at the time uh, and in fact they've now built that language into their latest loan version so uh, until earlier this month one could uh, pick that language off the shelf and add it in as an option it's now part of the standard documentation but it doesn't tell you what the solution will be it just gives you a mechanism that makes it easier to introduce a solution, so for example, you will not need all bank, you'll just need majority bank approval to switch over from one mechanism to another. And it doesn't tell you what changes will go with that because you'll have to look at the mechanism when it comes up. And at the same time, they have uh, published what are called exposure drafts of their loan agreements uh, for, for anticipating the possibility that people will want to switch to risk-free rates and therefore adapting the loan in a way which will be suitable to risk-free rates but at the moment not giving you a number of the key elements that would be involved in making that switch over so those drafts when they call them exposure drafts they're not intended to be uh, use uh, usable in their current form but they're intended to give people an idea which they might feed back on or use as a basis for their own agreement if they want to go down that route but in no sense are they yet a market position so there are drafts out there but they've got significant gaps in them as to how they will work so to understand what the issues are with the switch from libel to a, a risk free rate, you need to understand roughly what they are. So, uh, SOFA is produced by the Fed 
uh, and it measures <coughs> the cost of borrowing US dollars overnight collateralized by US government securities, hence the repo market. Um, it's calculated by references, reference to transactions which are actually executed in the, in the overnight uh, repo market, as opposed to LIBOR, where a number of its calculations are not actual transactions, but are uh, people's view of what a transaction would have been if it had taken place. These are actual transactions. And it's produced as a percentage rate per annum, but it's, remember, it's only an overnight basis. And it's produced every New York business day on what we call a backward looking T plus one basis. In other words, it's produced uh, on the day after the uh, deposit was placed. <clears throat> and it produced uh, initially at eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and then that can be corrected at any time up to uh, 2.30 in the afternoon. So, <clears throat> what are the issues? Um, cost of funds. Uh, well, no. So it's not measuring the cost of borrowing money unless you happen to sit on sufficient treasuries to secure all your borrowings overnight. Um, and uh, that just isn't banking, is it? Banking, of course, is leveraging, and you don't sit on those level of assets. So it, it basically, there's a differential between the uh, rate at which you can borrow on this basis and the rate on which a bank can borrow unsecured in the market. Now, uh, I'm told by those who know much more than I do that typically the two track each other very closely with a, a differential that's said to be around three. Uh, percentage points, uh, but that's only typically. Yeah. One of the real issues is that uh, when the markets get tough and things get difficult, uh, the SOFA rate tends to go down, but LIBOR tends to go up. And often cited is a, a, the big differentials that people saw back in 2008, 2009. But but even now, so uh, I'm told that on March the 19th this year. There was uh, 108 basis points between the two. So the two don't track each other. You, you, the actual cost of borrowing for a bank uh, and the repo rate are not necessarily in line with each other. So they're normally very, very close, but as uh, markets get difficult, they can spread quite significantly. And so if you want to use this as a basis uh, for a pricing benchmark for actually lending on, you've got a difficulty that you uh, it doesn't actually reflect this credit and, and, and the liquidity premium that goes into your cost of acquiring funds to lend them on. So you either need to come up with a formula which makes that adjustment and, uh, or, or, or allow for it by increased margins. But unless there's a flexible margin, it's not quite clear how you cope with that uh, change in the differential. <clears throat> so. First issue. Second issue, SOFA and other risk-free rates are backwards looking. In other words, you don't find out what the rate is until after <coughs> the period. And if you want to use it as a term basis, you're going to have to wait till you know, 30 days uh, or 90 or whatever your period is. And then at the end of that, look backwards to see what the rate was. Now, uh, I have to say, initially, I, I, I found that philosophically very difficult. Uh, I think from a lending point of view, I, I, I can get my head around it very easily. From a borrowing point of view, it's obviously much trickier because um, <clears throat> the borrowers are used to this idea of knowing what their commitments are, looking ahead and selecting their interest periods accordingly. Whereas now, they won't find out what their rates were going to be until after the events have happened. And if uh, the market has gone bad in the meantime, they, it will be too late for them to avoid it. They can't work their way around it by taking a different interest period or even getting out of their loan. They will be stuck with whatever rate has occurred between the beginning of their interest period and the end of their interest period. So that, that very philosophical position is, is interesting and difficult. Um, there is then a number of mechanical difference, difficulties one of which is just the timing of the publication. It's 0800 Eastern Standard Time, could be changed up to 1430, 
which by then is, is actually close of business or beyond close of business in Europe, for example. <coughs> so you're actually probably at T plus two, you know, two days after the end of, of the pricing arrangement before you find out what the pricing arrangement certainly was uh, if you're looking from a European perspective. Um, and then I, I say here calculation period versus date for payment, which is that before you can expect a borrower to pay interest for a period, you need to wait for the period to end and then give him time to uh, calculate it and then time to pay. Uh, and so you, again, you're adding on potentially a couple of days extra and <clears throat> yet you want your interest to be paid up to date. So how do you do that? How do you not know what your interest is till a couple of days after the interest period has ended and then have a calculation and then have a time to pay. So at least three business days after the end of the period. Uh, and yet you want to be paid up to date. And the only way to do that is to misalign the calculation period with the interest period. In other words, you have a calculation period that starts a few days before your interest period, ends a few days before the end of your interest period, and then you pay at that rate up to the end of the interest period. So the misalignment between them the market days pricing which you're using and the days for which you're charging interest. <clears throat> but that seems to be the way forward. There's been much talk about trying to actually get a forward-looking SOFA or SONIA rates. Uh, no one seems to have come up with uh, as yet a workable solution and the LMA drafts which I mentioned earlier are certainly looking at the idea of this being a backward-looking rate and uh, they don't actually come down with a specific time frame, but uh, they're generally talking about a five business day offset. In other words, you start your calculation period five business days before the interest period is due to start, and you would use the rate across the interest period, and it would finish five days, business days before the end, and then you would pay that same rate up to the end of the interest period. <clears throat> so that but that's not fixed. There's no market agreement on that. That's just proposals that are out there. <clears throat> and and the other thing that they mention is, is that their documentation allows the idea that you would have what they call a primary screen rate. In other words, if somebody out there produces the rate, uh, then that would be the one you would use and you would select that. But if they don't, then you would need the agent bank or whoever it is who's uh, doing this to actually make the calculations themselves. So lenders would have to have the capacity to do that calculation unless they were sure that there was somebody out there producing an accepted rate. Now, the good news is that since I, I started to look at this for today's talk, that they have actually come out with that Fed uh, rate, published rate. So if you're looking at the 30, 90, 180 day periods, we can now actually, adopt the Fed uh, index, uh, published index, as our primary screen rate, and we would have a solution for that. <clears throat> and then you've got uh, a couple of other issues to, to think about, which is break costs, should there be any. I mean, historically, when you uh, were borrowing, you would pay break costs based on uh, paying back in the middle of an interest period. But if your uh, interest rate is being calculated retrospectively, mm -hmm based on an overnight rate, there doesn't seem any obvious reason why there would be any break costs. On the other hand, if I'm a lender, I'm slightly disappointed that my loan is paid back without notice, so because I haven't got the opportunity to lend it out to someone else. So you might need to change your concept of break costs or uh, just impose a, a longer period. So that you either say, um, I get uh, five, or 10 or whatever business days notice of a uh, loan being repaid, or if I don't, then I get some sort of measure of uh, a fee, but not related to the underlying cost of breaking my deposit, but just my loss of earnings on the money because I need uh, time to redeploy the assets. And the final issue to, to uh, or key issue I've looked at is market disruption or not. <clears throat> the market disruption has, of course, <clears throat> always been a, a little bit of a, a, an odd area, uh, whereby under the standard agreements, uh, typically if half your lenders say that they can't fund at 
the LIBOR rate that's on the screen, then you can call a market disruption and switch over to another alternative uh, source of calculating the rate. Some loans have even less, 30% I've seen <clears throat> of lenders. Now, I've always found that slightly odd because LIBOR traditionally is based on a um, panel of banks and it's the average of the rates available to the panel of banks. Uh, I'm no mathematician, but roughly speaking, I would expect at any given time half the panel to be unable to borrow at the average rate and half to be able to borrow better than the average rate. So uh, it doesn't seem to me that it would be market disruption to find that half your banks can't quite make the LIBOR rate that's been chosen. Um, so market disruption was always a slightly odd concept. If we're now moving over to a system where we're not actually looking at cost of funds at all, but the repo rate, then uh, what is the market disruption? How do you benchmark it? It's nothing to do with the rate at which banks can borrow. So they need to decide, do we just drop the concept of market disruption or are we actually measuring something else? Do we have market disruption? For example, if our uh, adjustment factor, the methodology we've used to determine the difference between the risk-free rate and the credit risk rate, do we have a methodology which says if that spread widens beyond a certain point, then we can call market disruption and change the basis of our lending cost. But then how do we show that? We're no longer having LIBOR, so what are we benchmarking against? This is an issue which, even in the um, working drafts that have been put out there, is left open for banks to decide. So, under the exposure drafts, what they've got is that interest for the interest period will be determined by reference to a compounded average of SOFA. Uh, that average is arrear, in arrears and starts before the beginning of the interest period and ends before the end of it and you open what the periods will be and it uh, uh, provides that if there isn't an, a primary screen rate so if there's nobody out there publishing a rate which is adopted then uh, the agent or the lender has to calculate how this is done but it doesn't tell you how he would do that so he needs to have the capacity and the decisions to do it. <clears throat> it leaves you exposed to uh, the difference between SOFA and cost of funds. Uh, it proposes to you that you should actually uh, not use an adjusted margin to cope with this, but you should add in a, a secondary factor. So you would have the reference rate, an adjustment to the reference rate to reflect a cost of funds difference plus a margin but it gives no guidance as to how you would make that adjustment. It gives no guidance on dis market disruption and it gives no guidance on how to address break costs. So what do you do? <clears throat> well, for now, you've got existing facilities out there. You need to check them to make sure you've at least got fallback language so that you can go over to an alternative cost of funds, uh, preferably lender's actual cost of funds in the interbank market but uh, potentially other choices available too. You can consider taking the LMA optional language and introducing it into an existing loan which will make it easier in the future to adopt uh, some sort of replacement rate but remember it's not just going to be opting for a replacement rate it's going to be adopting a whole new mechanic or changing over from forward-looking rates to potentially to looking at backward-looking rates, et cetera, et cetera. And until you know what it is, you can't adopt it. So all this is doing is making it easier, not actually solution, providing you with a solution. For new loans, like I said, you can put this language in from the start and it is now out there in the LMA standard wording. You could work out your own solutions to how you would like to adjust for uh, moving from RFRs to cost of funds. So do you have a pricing solution for the differential, the credit risk differential, which a lender will uh, have? And what would your solution be for your personal circumstances? Do you have a position on market disruption? Do you have a position on break costs? Are these something which going forward you can just ignore 
or do you have a reason why you want to have a particular solution and what will it be? You can, I put here lobby for a common calculation methodology, but I suspect that at least as far as sterling and um, uh, SOFA uh, dollars are concerned, the, the published indices will be the ones which people are using and the bit you need to uh, find a common market position for is, is things like the daily differential that you will use and just put yourself in the position to adopt the new standard when the market becomes clear. If you want to be brave and be the first to do it, also be aware that there may be a downside if the market does something slightly different. But that, to my mind, is, is the best you can get to today. You cannot go out there for certain and say, this is the way it's going to work. You could try and put together, and I think there is enough out there now where you could actually do a, uh, a loan based on a, a backward looking uh, SOFA rate for dollars. Uh, if you made your decision about the offset of your calculation period, if you made your decision about how to deal with break costs and market disruption, and if you could get yourself comfortable on what the cost of the credit risk differential is between SOFA and your actual cost of funds, you could actually go out and do that loan today. But there's no certainty that whatever you did would become the market standard, and therefore, if you were trying to, <coughs> for example, sell that pieces of that on in the future, you might find it slightly out of line with what people are buying. It might make it difficult to trade, but you could do it. So my final thought is to offer you a, a, a saying from uh, Metternich, which is that this will end as everything does, somehow or other. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Richard, for an excellent overview. Clearly, there are a lot of challenges ahead uh, that will create um, opportunities and challenges for, for the market, but the technology will likely play a, play a role. Now, we have come towards the, we've obviously over time right now. Um, so everyone feel free if you need to drop off to drop off. We'll make this available online at marinemoney.com uh, either later today or tomorrow. Um, but we maybe have time for two questions that uh, came in through the audience. So the first one is, uh, Richard, so shall we expect every bank using different benchmark rates or can borrowers' rights be protected, especially if lending is with bank A and interest rate swaps with bank B? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. If we're talking about existing or new facilities, I mean, so new facilities will be whatever is agreed. Uh, it, it, it's unlikely that people will actually be using different benchmarks because uh, of the published ones that are out there. But what is quite likely is whether you get an adjustment factor uh, will be different from one bank to another. So the way that they treat the differential between the RFR rate and the cost of funds rate could make a difference. So uh, we haven't seen any developments yet which suggest a common approach to this. So yes, you could end up uh, having a differential on that. Yeah, and that to be clear, that was for existing. Well, for existing and future uh, going forward. I mean, you, obviously going forward, you have the choice of not going into that loan if you want to, whereas uh, with existing, you are more stuck with what you've got, uh, and and the, the, there isn't actually a mechanism yet where lenders can impose this sort of stuff on people. But you could end up with a position where you either take what they offer or you have to repay, uh, which is uh, possibly the same thing as allowing them to impose it. But it, right. we, yes, we. But it's quite likely that in terms of general benchmark, the published rates which we're now starting to see will be used at the RFR rates. Uh, but, uh, like I say, the differential treatment for cost of funds uh, uh, versus risk-free rate uh, may well vary significantly and will not be f uh, covered by the swaps because the swaps are likely to go straight to a, <coughs> a pure risk-free rate basis. Okay. Um, another question is, as the market is not clear now, how would you draft a loan agreement with you, without using LIBOR? And the emphasis is on you, Richard, because of your extreme talent in this area. Did, did you say without using LIBOR? Without using LIBOR. Yeah. So if we didn't want to use LIBOR, uh, I, I, I would go straight to uh, the uh, LMA um, drafts that are out there uh, and use that uh, <laughs> as the basis for it. 
I link it to the uh, Fed's uh, published SOFA rates. Um, uh, I, I would uh, probably drop the idea of break costs, or, or at least substitute it with a fixed notice period and a fixed compensation for failing to give the necessary notice. Uh, I would um, drop. Uh, no. I, I would, I would. The, the difficulty I would have, which isn't so much a legal question, it's one that you need your lender to decide, which is what mechanism he wants to use to adjust between risk-free rates and his cost of funds rate, and depending on what that is, we'd need to design a, a market disruption provision around that, so that if whatever uh, assumptions have gone into that test prove to be incorrect because of you know, significant market variations, uh, you would want to be able to switch out of using that methodology. So that would be your market disruption. So that would be the those two factors which are linked together would be the the area which still need to be thought about and, and discussed because it's a commercial decision for a bank as to how and to what extent it's prepared to expose itself on that risk. Got it. And then just one final question, Richard. Um, how will the swap market work when LIBOR reference rate is eliminated? Well, the swap market will go over to the risk-free banks. And, and the swap market is it's actually quite interesting because they're all done through um, a, a standard format uh, and with the Swap Dealers Association behind it, it's much easier to impose uh, or persuade everyone to have a common change across the board. Yeah? So you know you can in, they can introduce a standardised switchover for all their LIBOR-based ones to some to to a risk-free rate one, and and because everybody's uh, documentation is in the same format, that that can be adopted by everybody across the the board. So um, so that's that's potentially how it's going to be done. But of course that won't necessarily work for those who want to keep you know who've still got a LIBOR exposure. <laughs> But of course, LIBOR, LIBOR um, based swaps never worked once they went into market disruption. So, you know, once people started to call market disruption during 2008, 2009, uh, you know, the amount your swap paid out didn't match what your loan paid out uh, or what your loan cost you because they went on to different mechanisms anyway. So, if you end up in market disruption because they insist on keeping a LIBOR rate, then they have their own mechanism in the swaps which they would follow, but much more likely is is that they're going to switch them all to risk free rates, and it, and it's much simpler to do for the swap market because of this um, common format and and the much more centralised control through the swap dealers associations and and, and also through the need to um, keep the with swaps you have to keep to those formats because otherwise you can't get the opinions which show that you get close out netting and things like that. Got it. All right. Well, I think that's all we have time for. I know that we are approximately 15 minutes over, so I apologize for that. But I also wanted to thank you, Richard, for taking the time to take us through this, this topic of LIBOR. Um, this webinar will be posted, like I said, on the website, so keep an eye out for that. And we will keep you updated on the next week's webinar. Um, but for now, this is John Chair from Marine Money signing off, and stay healthy and good fortune. <laughs>